Hey there, this is Ari. And before we get into today's episode, I want to tell you about one of my absolute top recommendations for disease prevention and longevity, adding years to your life. And that is using inside tracker technology. More broadly, you know, beyond this specific recommendation that I have, getting a comprehensive blood panel done every six to 12 months consistently throughout your life and looking at those markers and then running it through a system that tells you what are the practical things that you can do based on your specific biomarkers that are out of range, what are the practical things that you can do to lower your risk of disease and add years of your life? I think this is an absolute, uh, absolutely invaluable tool that uh, I myself have come to fully appreciate just in the last couple of years, and especially the last few months that I've actually been using Inside Tracker. Uh, this is an amazing tool. I want to show you briefly a little bit about how it works and what it does. I'll log into my account here. Okay, so as you can see, this is inside of my account. Um, one of the cool things that they're showing you here is they actually ask you questions about uh, your diet, about your exercise routine, about many, about your, your supplements that you're taking, many, many other aspects of your lifestyle. And they also can take into account your DNA, your DNA results. If you've done a 23andMe test, or you can actually buy a DNA analysis through Inside Tracker, and they're simultaneously taking all that information along with your blood panel and then providing recommendations to you based on that. There's also this amazing technology over here, Inner Age, which takes into account your biomarkers and shows you what your uh, basically your, your biological age is based on those biomarkers, uh, as opposed to in contrast to your true, uh, chronological age. So, you know, I'm 38 years old. What's my biological age based on this? Um, it also gives you deep analysis and recommendations. And this is the big thing. So you load up your blood test results. And if you want to add information about your nutrition, your supplementation, your exercise and other lifestyle habits, sleep habits, things like that, if you want to uh, get DNA results and load those up, it synthesizes all of that information and then tells you practical recommendations of what you can do. So for example, uh, this is me here. You can see my inflammation group. I'm right where I need to be in this optimal zone. Uh, and if I wasn't, it would tell me, hey, here are the things that you need to, you know, specific foods that, that you should be eating and integrating into your diet to help bring that um, into proper range. This is CRP, another measurement of very important of systemic inflammation, which uh, also is very indicative of heart disease risk. And you can see I'm pretty much rock bottom. Uh, and that is where you want to be. If you're up here, in this high zone, it will tell you that, and it will give you specific practical recommendations of what you can do to lower your risk of, in this case, um, you know, the, 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 one of the biggest contributors, uh, to mortality, one of the, the leading causes of death, death, and actually the leading cause of death in the United States for many years running and most of the Western world. So this kind of thing is to be honest, something that I didn't fully appreciate until just the last couple of years, and especially just the last few months, um, now that Inside Tracker is widely available and I've started using it. And I can see uh, the insights that, uh, that, that it's giving me. And you can see that little pop-up on the screen there. It's saying, you know, it's time to take action. Let's go to your action plan and see what to do about it. So uh, this is giving amazing insight into catching a lot of things that a standard blood panel and a standard checker, standard checkup with your doctor are simply not going to catch. These are based on not just normal ranges, but what are the optimal ranges. So um, you may be in the normal range and your doctor may not say anything about a whole bunch of things, but then you can run it through inside tracker and it will say, well, you could optimize this one. You could optimize this one. You could optimize this one a little further. And that is incredibly important because, uh, whereas a standard blood panel is going to pick up things once you have already deteriorated essentially into a full-blown disease state, 
this is a much more sensitive, narrow range that can pick up problems before they manifest into a full-blown disease state, before uh, you, your chronic high iron levels are actually causing severe oxidative stress and have damaged the endothelium of your blood vessels and contributed to atherosclerosis or um, hindered immune function and made you more susceptible to chronic infections. Or before this chronically high levels of inflammation have manifested as a heart disease, before um, the, the mild alterations in thyroid hormones have contributed to a full-blown destruction of the thyroid gland and full-blown hypothyroidism, you can catch that early and implement things to uh, preserve your thyroid gland and keep your thyroid levels optimal, which in turn decreases your risk of many different diseases, like again, heart disease, for example. Um, you can also catch things like insulin resistance and, um, and, and, uh, you know, from looking at some of the, the blood sugar levels from looking at, um, glycated hemoglobin and things like that. And you can figure out, are you on your way to diabetes and then get a series of practical recommendations of what to do about it. And again, this is the big thing that differentiates inside tracker from just a standard blood test. It is it's giving you that blood test, but it's also giving you much more importantly, the analysis of that blood test and then access to the latest and greatest science as of 21, 2021 and 2022, uh, as far as what we can do about it to optimize those biomarkers, put ourselves back into a healthier state and decrease our risk of those diseases. So this is in my mind, one of the absolute most important things that you can possibly do for your health and to prevent disease and to extend your lifespan is simply every six to 12 months, get a comprehensive blood panel done, run it through inside tracker, be tracking that religiously, consistently every six months or 12 months at the most. And that way you, you're going to pick up any problems before they manifest in any sort of full-blown disease states and before they really disrupt your health and your life in a profound way. And this is also just a tool, even if you already feel great, like I do, um, I'm still using this um, because I want to be absolutely optimal. I want to know, well, you know, do I have, even if I'm in the normal range, could it be optimized further? And there, and there were a number of things for me that that was the case for. Yeah, I, I was pretty good for certain things, but it could be even better. Okay, well, now what can I do to optimize that? So let's say someone has um, insulin resistance and high levels of uh, glycated hemoglobin, for example. Okay, well, maybe now I want to really examine my body composition and take action to start to fix that. Maybe I want to start taking things like uh, berberin and cinnamon extract and um, alpha lipoic acid to optimize that insulin sensitivity and so on. You know, the many, many things that you can glean from this and turn it into practical recommendations. And in fact, Inside Tracker will do that for you and tell you exactly what to do to optimize those biomarkers and decrease your risk of those diseases. So this is an absolutely invaluable tool. I highly, highly recommend it. You can go to insidetracker.com forward slash energy. And then when you check out, enter the discount code energy blueprint, and they'll give you a nice discount on your purchase. So go do that right away. I strongly recommend it. Okay, now let's get into the episode. Hey, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint podcast. With me today is my friend, Evan Brand, who is a certified functional medicine practitioner and nutritional therapist. He is passionate about healing the chronic fatigue, obesity, and depression epidemics, particularly after dealing with and solving his own IBS and depression issues. He uses at-home lab testing and customized supplement programs to find and fix the root cause of a wide range of health symptoms. He is the author of Stress Solutions, REM Rehab, and the Everything Guide to Neurotropics. He offers 15-minute free functional medicine phone consultations 
to discuss your health symptoms and goals at his site, evanbrand.com. So with that said, uh, I really enjoyed doing this podcast with him. Uh, the, there was a really nice flow and a back and forth that we had. And uh, there was also, you know, we, we took a deep dive into some kind of, you know, heavy kind of functional medicine topics around mold and gut issues and things like that. And, you know, what goes into um, lab testing and protocols. Uh, and then, you know, as we sort of wrapped into the, the tail end of the episode, uh, we went in a really surprising direction and uh, that I particularly enjoyed personally. And I think you will too. So uh, I hope you enjoy this episode with Evan Brand. So welcome to the show, Evan. Such a pleasure to have you. Ari, thanks for having me. Yeah. So let we just wrapped up uh, an hour and a half conversation. Where was it uh, that were, long? It felt uh, it felt like twenty minutes. <laughs> it was a good conversation. It was a lot of fun. You were interviewing me for your podcast, so we're in a good flow right now. And I feel like I know you, and I got a lot of insight. Um, even as you were interviewing me, kind of interjecting some of your commentary, talking about working with thousands of patients, looking at thousands of, um, of blood tests and other kinds of testing results and evaluating the problems that are going on and doing that detective work, that sort of one-on-one -on -one detective work. What are this person's unique issues that we need to address and how can I put them on protocols to, to, to get this resolved? So in that work of working with thousands of people. And I assume, you know, maybe at least hundreds, if not maybe over a thousand people with chronic fatigue issues. What do you think are the biggest issues, the biggest factors that are contributing to people's chronic fatigue? Number one's mold. And I just figured that out like three years ago when I got sick with mold. If you would have asked me three plus years ago, four, five, six, seven years ago, I would have said it was some sort of chemical gut mitochondrial type thing, but it was kind of airy fairy back then. It wasn't super concrete. So I would come in and I would give mitochondrial support. We would do CoQ10 and ribose and carnitine and creatine and PQQ and ashwagandha. And maybe we would throw in some liver support and some other adrenal support, and then people would get better. But then my protocols started to, I don't want to say not work because they still work, but then I was just getting this growing percentage of the population and the practice where they're just like, Evan, I'm doing everything you're telling me and I'm not getting better. And on paper, we would run the organic acids test, which we still run on everyone. And we would look at their mitochondria and you can measure the metabolites on the urine. So the higher these markers go, whether it's fumaric acid or malic acid or succinic acid, the higher these numbers go, the more mitochondrial damage someone has or mitochondrial dysfunction. And so for years, I was just giving these nutrients and then everyone was getting better on paper, but then they were obviously feeling better too. So then they leave me a five-star review. My energy is so much better. But then this, this like elephant in the room was this, this group of people who they weren't getting better. And I kind of felt like a failure. I was like, okay, well, what do I do now? And then I got sick. And I had already dealt with gut issues for like a decade. I mean, that was my bread and butter. I was kind of the, the gut guy or the parasite guy. I mean, I've been on every parasite summit that exists and Lyme disease summit and all of that. And those are certainly huge, huge pieces of chronic fatigue, which must be investigated. So anybody that has not looked into getting a DNA stool sample run, getting a DNA urine for Lyme and co-infections or possibly blood or antibody testing for like Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, uh, Auriclea, Mycoplasma, Epstein-Barr, some of those things, you got to rule those in or out. But this other group of people, we had already ruled all that stuff out. And then I got exposed to mold. And I was, I was totally ignorant. And I just thought when you hear mold, you think it has to be something visible. It's got to be nasty. It's got to be growing on the wall. Otherwise, it's not a problem. And that wasn't the case for me at all. We didn't see any mold at all when we got exposed. It was just simply in the air and it was floating and you're an innocent bystander. And water damage buildings are epidemic. And I know where you are in Costa Rica with the high humidity level, I guarantee mold is an epidemic problem there. I've got a friend who lives down in Costa Rica and I know that he told me his place is open air. He doesn't have any windows. He does, I mean, it's just totally open air. And he told me he had to throw away several pair of shoes since he moved to Costa Rica because his shoes got moldy. 
And I was like, dude, that's crazy. So the mechanism of mold and why I think it's the number one biggest smoking gun is because humans are inside 90, 95, if not 99% of their lives now versus back in the 1800s where like my grandparents, grandparents here in Kentucky, they were farmers. So they were outside all day, sun up to sundown. So even if they had a moldy old farmhouse, it didn't matter for a few reasons. Number one, they're outside all day, so they're not breathing it in. And number two, they had less toxicity in their bucket overall because they weren't exposed to chemicals. They didn't have vaccines. They didn't have pesticides in the food and they had leaky homes, meaning there was airflow and the solution to pollution is dilution. So they had enough airflow coming in these leaky old farmhouse windows to dilute the mold that may have been growing. But also, they didn't use drywall, they were using plaster. And so they didn't have paperback drywall, which is the perfect food for mold. So we have this like major confluence of factors all happening at the same time. We've got people on one side saying that EMF is doing it because it's pissing the molds off and molds make mycotoxins as a threat. So like Dr. Diedrich Klinghardt, he's a medical doc who treats a lot of Lyme and super sick people. I don't know why somebody hasn't done the study to just prove this yet because he keeps saying it and I keep regurgitating what he says, but nobody simply proved it yet, which is that molds exposed to Wi-Fi make 600% more mycotoxins. I don't know why you can't just easily prove that. Get yeah. a Petri dish with mold, put it next to a router, and then put sure. another one in a, in a Faraday cage away from a router. It seems easy to replicate. But, yeah. but anyway, so you've got paperback drywall. You've got energy efficiency standards where houses are so damn tight, they don't breathe anymore. You've got all these pesticides and herbicides and antibiotics, and everyone is so toxic that's why I think mold is the biggest, it's the biggest thing for chronic fatigue. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so much to say on that. I'll comment on the Costa Rica stuff first. Yet my house is very much open air and uh, it's designed, it's on the top of a kind of a mountain, small mountain. And it's designed actually in a special way by the architects to allow a huge amount of air to flow through the house at all times. So um, dilution effect is fortunately very good. There is also very strong seasonality in uh, where I live in Costa Rica. So six months of the year are very dry, six months are very wet. And um, we're just now at the end of rainy season, um, this six months of being extremely high humidity and everything gets moldy in the house. It's crazy, mold grows on everything and you have to take very special, I mean, everything that was in our garage, you know, that's just kind of sitting there, anything with any kind of, I mean, any kind of material that you think anything could possibly grow on, if it's sitting out, it will get moldy. So we have to put it all away into a closet with a dehumidifier for it not to get moldy. Um, and, you know, we have to have a maid once a week come in the house and, you know, clean pillows and cushions because mold will just grow on the fabrics. Mold Jeez. will grow on leather belts or shoes, as your friend noted. I mean, it, it'll grow everywhere. So yeah, it's definitely a problem. And as long as you um, get the, the fresh air, it's not too bad. I will also say about a year and uh, it was like beginning of end of 10, 2019, beginning of 2020, right? As, as COVID was starting up, um, I got the worst sickness that I've ever gotten in my life. And um, it was like six weeks of other than mono when I was in my mid twenties, but the worst respiratory illness where it was like six weeks of um, extreme coughing and like just full on cough attacks and severe fatigue. And I, I couldn't work out for five or six weeks. And anytime if I get a cold or a flu or something, it's a few days, maybe seven days or something, it's very mild. This was pretty severe fatigue and pretty debilitated. And then um, about a, um, a month or six weeks into it, we did go into my closet in my bedroom, six feet away from where I was sleeping. And my wife was going through the clothes, like, you know, spreading out some of the clothes and she sees an entire wall covered in mold. Oh. And it happened from water leaking from the other side of that wall, from the bathroom into that wall and creating all of that mold. Um, I still don't know if that illness that I experienced was COVID and it was exacerbated because of the simultaneous mold exposure, or if it was at the time, this was before COVID was even getting any notoriety. 
And I thought, I was thinking it's gotta be whooping cough or something. This, I've never had something like this, you know, such an intense respiratory infection. And uh, yeah, anyway, I, I, mold is no joke. For sure, it, it ran down my, uh, my immune system for many, many months and my energy levels for many months after that exposure. Oh man, that's nuts. Yeah, that's that's a couple of the mechanisms of why it would create a chronic fatigue situation. Number one, damages mitochondria. Number two, weakens your immunity. So then you get opportunistic bacterial overgrowth, you get candida overgrowth. So that was another thing too. I did a whole summit years ago just on candida, but then I realized I was kind of wrong in the sense that I didn't go upstream enough. I was thinking candida was this big root cause for brain fog and sugar cravings and bloating. So here we were targeting candida using antifungals and other antimicrobial herbs that were kind of blended together. I've got some custom blends I've formulated for candida problems. And then all of a sudden, same thing, I would knock the candida out. And then two to three months later, the people would come back and say, Hey, I've got candida again. We'd retest their urine. We look for a marker called arabinose, which is the gas candida produces, or we look at tartaric acid. And then sure enough, they've got candida again. I'm like, well, what are you doing? And they're like, I promise I'm not eating a bunch of sugar. I mean, I don't have any real explanation of why this is happening. And I was missing it. It was mold. And so now I know that if candida, someone has battled that, or if they've taken diflucan or fluconazole or itraconazole, kind of these standard conventional medications for candida or women that have recurring vaginal yeast infections and they can't beat it. I'm not going to say 99 out of hundred, but I'm going to say 98 out of hundred times there's mold. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. I, I was not expecting you to say mold as the, the most common thing. But we also need to, to couch this in the context that you're typically dealing with people with severe fatigue, not sort of more mild, more common, moderate states of fatigue that are going to result from the stress of life, sleep deprivation, circadian rhythm disruption, poor diet, drinking too much, you know, all this stuff that's pretty ubiquitous. You're talking about, you know, extreme states of fatigue and you, you feel the, the most common factor is, is mold and what you're seeing. I'd say I see all of it, to be honest. I mean, I see teenagers that don't have enough energy to get through soccer practice anymore to, wow. uh, I think we were saying it on, on, on your show or my show, I'm getting mixed up on toxins. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about young kids with toxicity. So I'll see five-year-olds where they're literally falling asleep in school and the teachers are telling the parents that the children can't stay awake. And so they're literally passing out on their desk every day. Are you keeping this kid up too late? You know, these are children that are getting in trouble at home uh, because they can't stay awake in school. So I, I kind of see it all, to be honest. I, I work with quite a few athletes, some UFC fighters that are just too tired and they can't recover from their training. And then you get into the more severe cases where it's people that are literally like bedridden or they simply just barely have enough energy to get through their job. And they're like, I'm failing as a parent because I barely have enough energy to do my work, but I got to do my work work to pay my bills. So what can I do to get more energy? So honestly, I probably see it everywhere on that energy, you know, fatigue spectrum. And sometimes it is super simple. Like it's just, they needed some nutrients. We'll send them off and tell them to get a few IV vitamin C's and some glutathione and some NAC and they're fine. And then other cases, it's like, no, you've got blasto, you've got giardia and crypto, you've got three different parasites, you've got fungal problems, like you said, you had a water leak, and there was a mold in the house. And now we've got to remediate the house just to get you better. And so sometimes it's like one silver bullet, but usually it's a combination of factors. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Okay, so let's say someone's got mold. And, uh, and I, I having just gone through this myself, I went on a protocol. But I'm curious what, what your protocol looks like. And I know there's a few different uh, sort of schools of thought around this. I'm forgetting the guy's name. Was it um, something Shoemaker, Shoemaker, Dr. Shoemaker? And then there's um, uh, Neil Nathan, Dr. Neil Nathan, who wrote the book Toxic, I'm sure you're familiar with. And I know that they have another kind of school of thought on some things. But what, what, what's your thought as far as treatment protocols? What's the best approach? Yeah, good question. I mean, it kind of depends on what you're up against. So yeah, Neil's Neil's awesome. His book's great. It talks about Lyme a lot too. I interviewed him. We talked about his approach to mold and how it differs from Shoemaker. Shoemaker's like super conventional. So he's going to go for like cholestyramine, which is like an off-label 
uh, cholesterol drug. And so it's basically a bile acid sequestrant, meaning it grabs onto your bile. So a lot of mold and other toxins too, this is the cool thing. So you know how people freak out about uh, flame retardants and they freak out about nonstick chemicals like the PFOAs and that kind of stuff that's in nonstick like uh, cookware. So one of the only molecules on planet earth that gets those chemicals out of the body is guess what? Cholestyramine which is pretty nuts. And so there's this enterohepatic pathway, meaning that the body's kind of lazy. Naturally, we're kind of lazy, meaning that we don't want to make new bile if we don't have to. So 95%, give or take of our bile is recirculated through this pathway. And then 5% is fresh bile made from the liver and then stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. And so what the cholestyramine will do is it'll bind to the bile and then you'll poop it out. So it's pretty interesting. You'll have some interesting looking poops when you get started with cholestyramine. I was miserable enough at my worst to take cholestyramine for a couple of months. Would I have done it long-term or would I have done it again? Probably not because what Shoemaker and some of these other people don't talk about is cholestyramine actually damages the mitochondria. And I don't know the exact mechanism of this, but if you look into cholestyramine mitochondria, the link is there. And so I think I made myself more tired, but then I made myself less toxic. So Number one, you got to fix the source. Like if you've got mold, you've got to cut it out and replace it with new materials, whether it's drywall, insulation, whatever, you've got to fix that. And then I have a whole line of products that I sell called Oasis. So like I have it right here on my desk, it's called Oasis Daily. It's a candle that we burn. It's literally seed oil. So we use grapefruit, lemon, lime, and tangerine, and you burn it and it denatures mold, but also candida. Side tangent, if you have someone with a big candida problem, they off gas it into the air. And pets often carry candida as well because mainstream pet food is crap. And so a lot of pets have candida and they're off gassing candida spores into the air. And what happens is you breathe in the candida, it colonizes your sinus cavity, it drips into your gut and recolonizes your gut. So many people that have major candida problems, it's because they're breathing in so much candida in their home. So we use something like the Oasis candles, or we have a mister or even a fog machine, which is more hardcore. And we'll fog someone's house to kill and denature not only candida, but mold. Otherwise they just keep getting reinfected and they never get better. So then they have to stay on antifungals and binders forever. So that's the missing part that most of the medical docs don't talk about is you got to fix the environment fully, or you can't get better. They'll talk about ERMI scores and that kind of stuff, but just ongoing maintenance. People think of like mold remediation as like one and done. And it's really more of like an ongoing thing, like monitoring and keeping humidity under control. Unless like you, you've got tons of airflow. So if you've got enough airflow, it's not a problem. But if your house is tight, like most American houses, you've got to have either ERVs, which are fresh air systems, which pump in the fresh air, so that's what I have, like right by my master uh, vanity in my bathroom, I literally can press a button and I can go low, medium or high, and I can determine how much fresh air I want to pump in. So it's pretty cool. And then that's, that's combined with whole house dehumidifiers. So if it gets above 40% in the home, they kick on, they suck the water out and pump it out through a tube outside the house. So once you get that stuff dialed in, in general, you don't have to think about it or worry about it. But if you don't get that part right, you won't get better and you can take all the charcoal in the world. So on the detox front, like cholestyramine is great, but like I said, you got the mitochondrial damage component. And of course you, with your expertise, you don't want any mitochondrial toxins or damage. So I would say if you can, if you're not at the bottom of the barrel, you know, clinging for life and you're meaning you're healthy enough to, to do other things, do other things like natural binders. So there are some plant sterols that you can use that sort of mimic cholestyramine, there's some natural cholestyramines out there, which kind of replicate the same mechanism of binding to the bile. And then you can combine that with things like silica and pectin and fulvic and humic acids, myconized chlorella, which can get across the blood brain barrier. There are certain clays. And then of course, charcoal is one of the, the main remedies. So when you stack all these together, then you can really get people better relatively quick. And when I say relatively quick, I would say six months to three years, depending on how sick they were. It took me almost three years. And I feel like I'm pretty good at what I do. It took me almost three years to get myself better and clean, meaning to where my urine test doesn't really show mycotoxins anymore. But the weird yeah. thing is, if I were to do a urine test right now, I still might pee out mycotoxins. So these things are hard. I don't know if I, me personally, if I can ever fully get to zero, because apparently I have a genetic issue like estimated 25% of the population does 
where it's called HLA-DR. Now I've not tested it, but I'm sure I have this issue. There's a genetic defect where certain people's bodies don't recognize mold. Therefore, it can't create a detox response. Whereas other people, like a really uh, cool mold inspector remediator that I worked with, I tested his urine. This guy is in moldy houses 24 seven and he had zero detectable levels of mycotoxins. I, how is this possible? He wasn't even taking any detox supplements. He's just genetically gifted to where he could be exposed. And so I know this is a little bit of a tangent, but this is why so many relationships fail because in the health world, a lot of times it's the man who thinks the wife is crazy because she's sick, she's symptomatic. He thinks she's just depressed or anxious or fatigued and it's emotional, but really it's because she genetically can't detox all the stuff that's in their home. So the scented laundry detergent, the chemicals in the water supply, the mold toxins, she is the canary in the coal mine. And he thinks she's crazy. So then they fight and get a divorce. So I've saved countless marriages just simply by detoxing the home and educating stubborn spouses that, hey, this is real. They're not crazy. Nice. Health coach and function functional medicine practitioner and relationship counselor, relationship <laughs> saver all in one. Yeah. I mean, how many times do you go to your marriage counselor and they say, hey, have you checked your house for mold? Or how many yeah. times do you go to your psychiatrist and they say, hey, have you ever considered it's mold? Zero. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, I've done, I've done a PhD program in clinical psychology. And one of the things that was kind of mind blowing going through that is um, you don't take a single course on anything related to nutrition or lifestyle. So you're talking about all these different psychological, psychiatric conditions, um, different forms of mental illness. And um, there's lots and lots of research that exists on the nutrition and lifestyle links to those things. For example, um, how, you know, eating well or eating poorly relates to depression or anxiety um, or sleeping and circadian rhythm habits relate to different kinds of mental illness, bipolar disorder, for example. Uh, and you don't, you're training clinical psychologists and psychiatrists to deal with those, those problems without giving them any education on any of the, the research related to nutrition and lifestyle. So it seems to be a pervasive problem across the board with that. Well, look at the, some of the research they did on the prison inmates, right? Where they started to give omega threes, just simple fish oil and the reduction in violence in the prison went down significantly. The mental health of the inmates improved so much just by adding a simple nutrient of fatty acids. So, I mean, yeah. there's so much out there that we could do such you know, like simple in most cases, extremely cheap nutrients that could totally transform the mental health. I mean, how about just like stabilizing blood sugar? I mean, how many people are having panic attacks because of hypoglycemia? And if they could just simply stabilize their blood sugar, they would feel so much better. I mean, that was me. I mean, when, when I was at my worst and I had major blood sugar problems, I mean, I was eating every two to three hours. And if I didn't, I was shaky and irritable. Now I could go five, six, seven hours and I feel great. So I think that's the hard part about this is half of my job is just trying to like educate people on where their issues are actually coming from because they've been told by conventional mainstream professionals that the anxiety is because of their stress and because of their upbringing and all that. And it totally could be, but how about because you ate a gluten-free bagel for breakfast and your blood sugar has crashed because you had zero protein and zero good fats to stabilize yourself. And that's why you're having anxiety in the boardroom at 11 a.m. Mm. Absolutely. So beyond mold, what other issues do you think are, are the most common contributors to fatigue problems? I'd say number two would be the gut. Okay. And, and I think of the gut as just this place where the magic should happen, but it rarely happens. And when I say magic, I mean the optimal absorption and assimilation of nutrients to help fuel the mitochondria. So one of the main mechanisms in the mitochondria is called the Krebs cycle. This is where you can manufacture ATP. And if you look at a picture of the Krebs cycle, there's a lot of different nutrients that plug into that cycle. So you have carnitine, you have B vitamins and other nutrients. And the problem is many people over 50% of the population has infections like H pylori. And this is a bacterial infection. The mechanism is it damages your parietal cells, P like Paul parietal cells. And those are the cells that secrete stomach acid. 
And we know with the great work of Dr. Jonathan Wright, he wrote a great book called Why Stomach Acid is Good for You. He did what's called a Heidelberg test where you put a little like a computer chip capsule into people's tummies. And he found that after age 20, just like everything else, unfortunately, your hormone levels drop, but so does HCL levels. And so by the time you're 40, you're making maybe half of the stomach acid you made when you're 20. Now you may be listening and go, well, you know, what the heck does stomach acid have to do with fatigue? Well, this hang in there. We're going to get there because the mechanism is now all of a sudden you're eating this grass fed steak or whatever, this avocado, if you're plant-based and you want good fats, you're eating that. And hopefully you're going to take this grass fed steak and you're going to convert that. And you're going to cleave off all of these proteins and amino acids and B vitamins. And then you're going to optimally produce hormones and neurotransmitters and fuel that Krebs cycle to generate ATP. But the problem is number one, if it's simply age, you're 40, 50, 60 beyond, you're already at a disadvantage. That digestive fire is only burning at 50% capacity. And now you combine that and stack that with, let's say you didn't chew your food enough. You did a scrolling bowl, which I call where you're like scrolling on your phone while you're at Chipotle eating your burrito bowl with your carnitas and your rice, you're scrolling and bowling. That's what I call it. Now you're distracting your body from digesting because you're stressed out about the latest news story you're reading on your smartphone while you're eating. But then you combine it with that infection and that infection turned down your already low due to stress and age HCL to almost nothing. So now you've got this fermentation and putrefication of all these nutrients. And instead of optimally digesting and fueling the cycle, it's not happening. And all that chaos we described, that's only one infection. It's very rare for me to find just one infection. So most of the time we're finding H pylori, but as a side effect of lowering the stomach acid because of this environment that has a higher pH. So just basic, just for people in case they forgot about this, the lower the number, the more acidic. So give or take, you want your stomach pH around 1.5 to maybe two. That's so acidic that if you could just pour that stomach acid on your shoe, it would melt your shoe. Like that's how acidic it's supposed to be. But we live in a society where due to infections or medications like proton pump inhibitors, which are a best-selling drug that now you can just get over the counter, just like candy, go buy your Tums, go buy your Prilosec or Zantac because of your heartburn, which guess what? H. pylori causes heartburn. So you have this infection that lowers your stomach acid. Now you go get the heartburn medication at the pharmacy. You lower your stomach acid even more. Now you've just made your stomach much more alkaline which is not a place that you want alkalinity is in the stomach. So now all these other bacteria like Prevotella, which triggers rheumatoid arthritis starts to grow or Klebsiella, which is a bacteria that triggers Hashimoto's or ankylosing spondylitis and possibly other autoimmune diseases. Now those bacteria begin to thrive. And then now Candida is like, Oh, this is a nice place. I'm going to move in too. So now you've got this whole slew of infections and not only are they disrupting your gut barrier, creating leaky gut, now opening up the bloodstream to these undigested proteins, which then triggers the immune system to attack the joints in the case of RA or attack the thyroid in the case of Hashimoto's. But now these infections are robbing you of, their, of your nutrients. So then when you test these people, they have no vitamin C, they've got no B vitamins, they've got low neurotransmitters, they've got mitochondrial damage, low dopamine, low serotonin, and we wonder why everybody's crazy and exhausted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. And you can so, measure this. So I think that's the most empowering message of all this is that a lot of it sounds like scary and maybe overwhelming. Like, how am I supposed to like tease all this stuff apart? Well, you just have to get a plan in place. You've got to try to lay out your big smoking gun. And mm -hmm. so maybe it's not mold. Maybe you're lucky and you don't have that. For me, it was a big smoking gun. The H. pylori was a big smoking gun for me. And unfortunately, I've had a lot of tick bites too. So some of the tick-borne issues, I'm still battling. But I think mentally, you've just got to come to terms with no one is going to save you. And so you've got to just plow through, I guess. I'm just kind of stubborn, I guess. I mean, there's many times where I wanted to give up, but I never have. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we were chatting about uh, in the, the last hour prior to, uh, to us starting this podcast was, uh, brain-based stuff. 
And, you know, I gave my thoughts on that, but I'd like to give you the opportunity now to, to talk about, you know, the role that you, you perceive in your clinical experience of, of working with so many people of what you've seen as far as people's mind states and psychology and what's going on in their brain and how that is relating to their illness. There are some people, you know, uh, peers and friends of ours who would argue that um, psychological stress and the way we use our minds is the biggest factor in illness. Um, you obviously don't subscribe to that, neither do I, but it is true for a subset of people. But what's, what's, your, what's your take on that? And what do you think, you know, what do you, what do, you do as far as working with patients who are struggling with that? Well, I love the idea, like Tony Robbins, he'll say like energy is motion. I forget, I'm going to butcher it, but it's something about you got to put your mind towards energy to create energy. Like the first step is to think energy and to move and things like that. And then automatically you have this kind of spontaneous generation of energy, almost like you could make it up out of thin air or like this law of attraction that you and I spoke a little bit about, or this idea that you can manifest energy. So I'm just going to sit here and met, you know, meditate. And I'm going to think about how good it feels to be energetic. And I'm totally cool with that. But I just feel bad for the people that they go all in on that. So I had a client a couple of weeks ago. He says, hey, I went and did this brain retraining program because it's been sold and marketed to all the people with chronic fatigue. And I went through this chronic fatigue program. I did it for six months diligently. They tell you to practice this thing for hours. This guy literally was like taking time off work, reducing his income just to do these brain retraining steps that he was like so confident that it was going to retrain his brain and get him out of chronic fatigue. And guess what? It didn't work. And you made the great point that certain people, maybe that's it. Maybe their brain was their biggest problem. And so for a subset of the people who do stuff like that, they will pull out of it. But for this guy, and I'd say for the vast majority of people I've seen, obviously I'm biased because they're reaching out to me because they need help. So maybe my answer is a little different, but I'd say for the vast majority of people, the brain is only one piece of the puzzle and there's no way. I just got to say it bluntly. You could meditate all freaking day. It's not going to get these mycotoxins out. It's not going to get these pesticides out. It's not going to repair your mitochondria. Maybe somebody will look back and they will use this clip of me and make fun of me and say, look at this, this guy, he's tried to say that the mind couldn't regenerate mitochondria. And we proved this guy meditated and we, he doubled his mitochondria just with his, with his thoughts alone. Maybe that that'll be the case. And I'll be like, God, I was so dumb and naive. I was so overconfident in the fact that you have to detox how dumb was I to think that the brain couldn't do this? I apologize. So I'll apologize to my future self. Maybe one day we're going to find that the mind is all you need to detox. But for now, I'm focused much more on granular things, concrete things that I know work and that I can test and prove and get a consistent outcome every time, which is if we see mitochondrial damage and we see someone with chronic fatigue, yes, we'll implement some of the brain strategies, but I'm also going to implement some of the binders mixed with mitochondrial nutrients. And then we're going to retest and we're going to see on paper, hey, we just took the mitochondria and now they look healthy. And also we're not seeing any visible toxin exposure anymore. We got all the toxins out and guess what? Their energy levels doubled. So I, I don't want to poo-poo it because I personally do brain retraining. It has helped me for chemical sensitivity that happened after I got exposed to mold. So I'm a huge proponent. I have meditations on my phone. I put my phone on airplane mode at night and I do these guided meditations, whether it's abundance or compassion or gratitude, I totally do it. But what I depend on that as just a singular therapy, no way. Yeah. Well said. So what about you mentioned infections and you, there, you know, obviously there's gut related infections, but you've also mentioned certain Lyme, uh, Lyme disease related infections. And I assume you also deal with certain viruses, Epstein-Barr or uh, uh, cytomegalovirus and probably others. Um, I know there is a lot of controversy around testing for these different viruses and what can uh, legitimately uh, diagnose a chronic infection with one of these viruses, and there's there's several different tests available. Um, I also want to say that I have seen I've seen many people go down a route 
where they're diagnosed, they're convinced that their chronic fatigue is coming from one or another specific chronic infection. And they've seen practitioners who have either uh, run tests that says they have it. Sometimes they've seen practitioners that says they, they say they don't have it. And they've done protocols. In some cases, I've seen people do multiple protocols over the course of years uh, designed to combat these specific viruses with virtually no success. So I'm curious if you can sort of speak to all of that. What, what role you think chronic infections are playing in chronic fatigue? Do you think that they're sort of at the root cause or they're more peripheral and you know, sort of come in opportunistically, um, but other root causes really need to be addressed? And how would you explain uh, the, the sort of the, the, the kinds of cases that I was just describing someone doing these protocols for many years and not really getting results? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I've had people come to me and say that they were diagnosed with Lyme and they pursued it for five years and they spent $20,000 in supplements and they're no better off. And I test them and guess what? They don't have Lyme. Wow. And I've seen people that were told they have adrenal fatigue and they pursue adrenal fatigue for five years with the adrenal guy and they get no better. Yeah. And then I've had people go to the thyroid guy for five years because they were told it was all thyroid and it was Hashimoto's and they get no better and they never address the other things. So yeah, it's a huge problem. And that's why I, I try to look at myself as a specialist in the sense that I look for root causes, but I'm extremely generalist and extremely practical at the end of the day, meaning I'm never going to go all in on one thing and say it's all thyroid. Because if you have Hashimoto's, you could give every nutrient you want for the thyroid, but if you don't get rid of the Klebsiella that triggered it or the other toxin that triggered this autoimmune attack, you could take every thyroid supplement in the category and never get better. And so it's a, it's a huge problem and it's just not as sexy. You and I talked a little bit about it on our previous recording together, which, which is it's not as sexy to say, hey, to fix this issue, not only do you have to remediate your home go to unscented laundry detergent, get rid of your fragrances, get rid of Wi-Fi, throw away your Apple Watch and AirPods for EMF protection, um, fix these gut infections, take extra hydrochloric acid, treat your H. pylori, kill these parasites, break up with your spouse because they're too toxic for you. Uh, and you got to change your job and you got to move. That's like, it. That's, that's it. it. Easy peasy. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's, a harder pill to swallow. So I think what that does is that leads to a, a, a subset of practitioners that they just want to focus on their stick because maybe that's what they're good at, or maybe what they, they had the most training on that. I guess I was fortunate in my suffering because I wasn't able to fix my issues with just fixing my gut. The gut was just one piece. So I, I try to look at it in a positive light, meaning that like my suffering led me down so many other rabbit holes I, because it, there's very, very few courses out there that fully teach you everything you need to know about mitochondria, everything you need to know about sleep, the gut toxins and, and everything. So I just had to learn. I learned the most probably by trial and error on myself, but also working with clients because a lot of the stuff I do, there, there's no book or course to even teach it. It's just like I had to piece it together because I was desperate. So I think desperation kind of creates creativity and maybe solutions, whereas other people, it's an easier living to just diagnose everybody with Lyme and, and just treat it. So that's the, the first answer to that question. And then the other part of the question was, well, how, how does that factor in? You were asking like, is Lyme like a subset or you, you mentioned something on the long lines of, does it come along with, or like, is it an adjunct to some of these other issues? And the answer is totally. And so what, what I find with Lyme and what are called co-infections, which could be Babesia, which is an intracellular parasite or Bartonella, which can come from mosquitoes or fleas or ticks, which is extremely common by the way. Um, and these things can, in children cause what's called PANS, pediatric acute neuropsychiatric syndrome, or if it's with strep, it's PAN does. So the AS means associated with strep at the end of the PANS. And so, um, these things, I mean, they'll rip your children away from you. It, it's quite terrible. And so I have a lot of experience with that. And these infections in the children could be the single big smoking gun. So something as simple as strep 
which can manifest as perianal strep, which is like a red ring around the children's anus. They could literally just have perianal strep and not have strep throat, and they could have massive neurological problems, sensory issues, uh, autism spectrum like behavior, uh, sound issues, uh, issues with their clothing, that kind of stuff. Uh, but in adults, I find that it's not as clear cut. There's not like one thing, like it's rarely just Lyme. I'm finding that mold, believe it or not, is actually allowing people with Lyme to stay sick. And the people that spent $20,000 with people that will, that we both know, but will remain unnamed for now, those people didn't go deep enough. So they found a root cause, but they didn't find the root cause that allowed the other root cause to thrive. Meaning if they simply get rid of the mold, a lot of times the immune system can come back online enough to handle the Lyme on its own without specific treatment, mm. which is pretty cool because here they are hitting all these different protocols and herbs for Lyme. And then we fix these Lyme, they call them Lymeys. I don't like that term, but we'll fix the Lymeys by just getting rid of the mold. It's like we never treated the mold, but they got better from Lyme. Right. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, very interesting. So we've talked about mold. We've talked about gut issues. We've talked about chronic infections. What do you feel are maybe one or two of the other big factors that you commonly address uh, working with people with fatigue? I think it's just apathy for the way the world has become. Mm, what do We're you not, mean? whether we want to admit it or not, us as humans are living completely different lives than what we are supposed to be living. And even people like you and I, who are entrepreneurs, who are able to have generally more freedom than your average person, you and I are still living lives. I don't want to speak for you, but I'm going to assume completely different than what our ancestors would have been doing. Yeah. five, 10, 20, 50 million years ago, in the sense that coming across others outside of our tribe would have been very rare. So people get labeled as introverted, but we were always introverted as a society because we were with our tribe and that was it. And if we encountered another tribe, maybe we fought or maybe we got along and that was about it. Now you go to the store or the market and you may encounter a thousand strangers and your nervous system is primed to assume that like, this is not my tribe. So I, I just think inherently our society is just so crazy and so different than what our DNA expects. And I think that just creates this subconscious or maybe conscious, like apathy for the way of life. And, you know, I think about how can I opt out of that? But ultimately, I have to play the game, I have to be part of the system, just like everybody else. I mean, I have more obvious, like, I can change my schedule at any time. If I don't want to work these hours, I change my hours, you know, so I have some things, but at the end of the day, I'm still participating in the same system as everyone else in the rat race. So I think ultimately one of our biggest problems is that it's, it's the rat race. I mean, think of that famous uh, rock song from when I was a kid, despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage. So I think ultimately you have to just come to terms with that and you have to find your way to please that human DNA. So mm -hmm. what I mean by that is music. We love music in our house. We're always playing Bob Marley or other reggae music or jazz music or classical music. We're trying, we're always trying to sing with our kids. We're doing the things that um, there was an old ancient proverb that went something like this was in, in regards to depression and uh, just misery. And and I don't know if it was a shaman or who it was, but the, but the question in the proverb was when you're investigating depression, when did you stop dancing? When did you stop singing? Mm -hmm. When did you stop loving something along those lines? And it yeah. always gives me goosebumps to think about that because when you're a kid, you kind of have it all figured out. Like, and I know you're a father of young children too. So you see this in your kids, kids have it figured out adults. They don't as much. And what I mean by that is kids can live in the moment. They can forgive quickly. They can forgive easily. They typically don't hold grudges. They're able to dance with music easily, sing with music, hum with music. I mean, my daughters will just hum no matter what it is. They're humming along to the song. They're living in the moment. They're looking at the sky. Daddy, what's that? Daddy, what's that? And then as an adult, you sort of have to put these blinders on to participate in society. Like 
creativity and that type of thing is not really encouraged because you got to work productivity, productivity. So I could rant on this all day, but, but the, but the long story short of it is people that are, are unhappy and they're fatigued because they're unhappy with the way of life that they have to do just to get by. So whether it's hunting, which I love, and that's when I'm out in the woods, like I took my daughter out this weekend, my five-year-old, we were sitting out in the blind together and we had a doe come in and she had two fawns with her. And she's like, daddy, you know, shoot or shoot one. I'm like, I can't honey. They're just, I don't want to shoot the mom. I could have, the babies would have been totally self-sufficient, but just that moment of seeing the glow in my daughter's eyes, seeing her pupils get bigger, seeing her watch these deer at a distance of 15 to 20 feet outside of us, out of, out of our blind. It was like, I saw the human switch turn on. And I was like, this is the human experience. This is what life's about. As opposed to you go to a restaurant in America, the kids have headphones and an iPad in their face the whole time at the table. It's like, so I think ultimately a lot of the fatigue is coming from the misery because we're going along with this life of what we're told is progress, but it is not progress at all. And the simple strategies of doing what humans evolved to do, hunt, sleep, have sex, listen to music, dance, play. Those are all of the things that are mostly free on this planet, which will provide the most joy and zest for life. Hmm. I love that. I love where you went with that, particularly as uh, I was expecting you to talk about some other thing that requires some you know, a whole bunch of uh, fancy functional medicine, fancy and expensive functional medicine tests, and then, you know, all kinds of, you know, very involved protocols to deal with it. I, I love that you went the direction you did. Do you, and, and this is a, this is too tough of, of a question to answer, but I just want to go a little bit deeper into what you were just talking about. What, what do you think is, is the answer to that? What do you think we need to do um, and not that you're going to solve all the world's problems, but if you're, let's say I'm doing, you know, I have my kids who are, you know, strapped to screens 24 seven and who are, you know, and I'm, you know, on social media and, you know, totally distracted from my life and, you know, in the rat race and I'm suffering the consequences of that. What do you think are a few of the key steps, practical steps that you would advise me to do uh, to move more towards the vision you're talking about there? Yeah, I mean, on the extreme side, you know, the the typical hippie answer is like create a permaculture community. It's off the grid. You know, everybody's like mostly naked and barefoot in the sunshine and you're living off the land and you're hunting like and it. gathering berries. So, I mean, you could go to that level. Or like you said, the more practical side that, that's going to be attainable, um, which is trying to find ways to live into the moment. And I tell you, and I'm not saying everyone needs to be a hunter, and maybe people are against hunting, even though that's what allowed humans to thrive. We evolved primarily by hunting. And a lot of these studies that archaeologists are doing, they did find, though, that, that recently that we, there is evidence of humans as scavengers, and there are evidence of um, woolly mammoth bones that were not only eaten and broken by what they're assuming were saber tooth tigers, but that there were also marks where our ancient ancestors were digging out the bone marrow of bones that were already somewhat eaten by other animals. So this idea that, that humans were not only just killers, but that we were also scavengers from these big fights of the saber tooth tiger and the woolly bear. So maybe we had many times where we subsisted primarily from scavenging and not hunting if we were not successful hunters. But either way, finding a way to get in tune with nature is like, is like my thing. I mean, that's why right here on my desk, I've got a pair of binoculars and I've got tons of directions to look. I could look very far in that direction, in that direction, in that direction. I've got kind of like a a starship, as in I have like six giant windows right behind my computer here, which is why I have so much natural light, which is great for the circadian rhythm, but also because I get to watch stuff all day. So, you know, in one day of working with clinical people, I could be watching great blue herons and bald eagles and ospreys and kingfishers and eastern bluebirds and deer. There was a buck that popped right out 
of this field of uh, grass and right at the edge of the woods here, a buck just wandered out into the field the other day and like, oh, it just totally changed the trajectory of my day. And mm -hmm. so even if it's just bird watching, finding a way to get in tune with nature, you completely forget about bills and social media and the latest mandate and whatever. You don't care. And so I think that's number one. I think number two is to hug people more. I'm a hugger. I rarely meet a stranger. And so I'll just try to hug my wife as long as she'll let me. I mean, if I can hug her for 30 seconds, we're going for a 30 second hug. Like that's awesome. So, I mean, people that are going to go, Oh, this guy's like losing me. He like sounded smart. Now he's turned into a hippie. Well, there's studies on this because you can, you can see rises in oxytocin from embracing people and skin to skin contact. I mean, there's a reason that for newborn skin to skin contact is so important, but also increases in heart rate variability. So I strapped a Bluetooth heart rate monitor onto myself before, and I hug my wife and I watch my heart rate variability increase indicating that my nervous system was shifting from sympathetic into parasympathetic. So it's not crazy to suggest these things, uh, even from a scientific perspective, if you have to have that sort of analytical brain and you need the data, the data is there. So hugging nature. Uh, I mean, I, obviously I love being barefoot in the grass in Texas. It was terrible though, because there were so many thorny plants. Every time I tried to go barefoot, I would end up with like this crazy thorn ball in my foot, but in Kentucky, luckily we don't have much of that. So I can go barefoot in the grass with no problem. Uh, I would also say, honestly, just watching the sun. I mean, why were the Egyptians so obsessed with the sun? Why were they so obsessed that they even create a sun god? I mean, for me on a cloudy day, I'm not as happy as a sunny day. Mm -hmm. So I'll just sit and just let the sun hit me. I'm, I mean, in terms of like nitric oxide production and blood flow and supporting circulation, I mean, obviously there's a ton of benefits there. I'm sure there's a link between sunlight and mitochondria. There's got to be some sort of benefit there because I'm much more energetic and perky when I've had plenty of bare skin exposure as opposed to cloudy days. I just don't oh, feel like I'm firing as much. Yeah, the, the red and near infrared light part of the spectrum from sunlight goes in directly into mitochondria, where they interact with cytochrome C oxidase, stimulate ATP production. There's also a hormetic aspect to it, and there's an aspect of what's called retrograde signaling, where the mitochondria um, detect the, the presence of those red and near infrared light photons and signal back to the nucleus of the cell to change the expression of certain genes. Uh, particularly switching off NF kappa B involved in suppressing, which is which ultimately translates into decreased levels of inflammation. Um, there's also uh, the mo probably most significantly from red and near infrared light switching on genes involved in growth and regeneration. So, for example, in the brain, nerve growth factor and uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor, IGF 1 in the muscles, and um, you know stimulating collagen production. There's also a mood boosting effect from improving serotonin and several other effects, but yes, sunlight is definitely highly beneficial and linked directly with mitochondria. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And great, great uh, scientific insight. And if you tell the hunter gatherer that they're going to say, duh, I mean, like humans are supposed to be outside. Like yeah. there, there was no inside people that are not outdoors people. It's like, what do you mean? There, there used to be no alternative besides a cave and you weren't going to live in there. Like, you know, you got to get out and get fresh air and sunlight. So yeah. that's, that's awesome. Awesome, man. Well, I, I love this. I love the direction you took it at the end there and unexpected twist to the story. And I, I love that message. I want to end on that note because it's so good. Um, can you tell people where they can get in touch with you and work with you or where, wherever you'd like to direct them? The floor is yours. Sure. I appreciate the opportunity. And yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, in regards to testing and all that, I still do a workup on everybody. I mean, I can't just prescribe sunlight and, and grounding and fix everyone's problems. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. So I think there is still a place to try to get data because if you're not testing, you're guessing ultimately. Now there are some foundational pieces you can put in everybody's protocol and most people will do better with those. But most people that come to me, they've already been to five, 10, 15, sometimes 20 practitioners, doctors, naturopaths, functional medicine people, Chinese medicine people, acupuncturists, you know, they've already been through the ringer. 
So now they're like, I'm friggin' sick of this. Please help me. And then that's where we use the testing to really help narrow things down. But could you just give people generic protocols and get them better? Yeah, you can get a lot of people better with no testing. And sometimes due to budget, I do. I have to guess and check. And sometimes the results are absolutely incredible doing that. So, mm -hmm. so that's that. Uh, on the, the podcast, so I've been doing that every week since 2012. So be coming up on 10 years pretty soon, which is kind of cool. Uh, so it's just called The Evan Brand Show. It's got over 15 million downloads. I put it out every week. You'll be a guest on there. We've already got ideas for part two. So that'll be a cool episode to check out. I've covered everything from EMF to COVID to the war on ivermectin to many other things that could get you deleted or banned or censored in other places. So that's all on the podcast, which you can get everywhere, just the Evan Brand Show. And then uh, same for the website. It's just evanbrand.com. And that's where I have another functional medicine practitioner on staff. She works with me. So we kind of tag team clients and we work around the world. And so I just like refreshed my website. We have a picture of a donkey on there on the homepage because we literally had supplements delivered to a client in Ecuador via a donkey. The last mile delivery was a donkey. So uh, I'm really honored and blessed. And I really love the opportunity to help people in literally every nook and cranny of the globe where most of this type of information is just completely non-existent and mostly unavailable yeah awesome man well it was great connecting with you i, I really genuinely enjoyed both of our conversations i think we've been on for an hour and a half longer than we originally scheduled uh and it was a pleasure and um, i look forward to the next one likewise thank you so much Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next